Grand Teton National Park is about 310,000 acres of semi-arid mountain climate and was established in 1929. However, the present-day Grand Teton wasn't established until 1950 due to the addition of more land to the park. The Tetons are one of the youngest mountain ranges in North America, being only about 8 million years old, hence they're known as adolescent mountains. If you'll notice, the Tetons are quite jagged, that's because they've had less time to be eroded away by the forces of nature. The Tetons formed when the Teton Fault moved, shifting the mountains upward and dropping an area called Jackson Hole downward. About 2 million years ago, the Earth cooled down significantly and caused glaciation to occur within the Tetons. This glaciation formed lakes and carved out valleys. Glaciers still remain in the park today, but to a much smaller extent. When snow accumulates, it will eventually get so heavy that it compresses into ice. This heavy ice will begin to flow, scraping rocks as this ice moves downhill. The snow melt from the glaciers is also very important as it provides water for many plants and animals. Six morainal lakes can be found at the base of the mountain range and they reach a maximum depth of 438 feet. There are also over a hundred alpine and backcountry lakes scattered throughout the park, as well as a multitude of streams and waterfalls. While in the Tetons, people will go climbing, hiking, cycling, bird watching, and camping. So come along with me as we explore some of the flora and fauna of Grand Teton National Park. Our first plant is Quaking Aspen, which is a small deciduous tree that has pale whitish gray peeling bark. We can see that its leaves are shaking in the wind pretty aggressively. That's because they have a long flattened petiole and a large blade. This shaking is a mechanism that helps the plant cool down. Additionally, this species can reproduce asexually through its root system, so it's likely that all of these Quaking Aspen are part of the same individual. You can actually tell in the fall which quaking aspen are part of the same individual when an entire clonal stand turns its fall color at the same time. Next we have lodgepole pine, which is a coniferous tree and are typically one of the first species to pop up after a fire because they have serotonous pine cones, meaning they open up when exposed to the heat. You can tell it's a lodgepole pine because they have two needles per fascicle or bundle these trees grow rapidly after a fire and will form dense stands like this one. However, they will eventually be replaced by other species like Engelmann spruce or subalpine fir that will shade the lodgepole pine out. Here we have Saskatoon, which is a deciduous shrub that forms thickets up to 3,000 meters in altitude in areas with rich soils. It produces an edible fruit that can be eaten fresh or cooked. Now the fruit we see here on the plant isn't ripe yet because it's still green, when the fruit is ripe, it's more of a dark blue color. The indigenous people of North America would use Saskatoon to make a food called pemmican. Next, we have snowbrush, which is an evergreen shrub that produces large terminal inflorescences of white flowers. The leaves are also arranged in an alternating pattern. Now, the flowers smell super sweet, and when walking through a field of them, you'll definitely notice that they're there. Large groupings of snow brush pop up after a fire because fire helps to break their thick seed coats. Additionally, the seeds of snow brush can sit and wait to germinate in the soil for 200 years. Lastly, snow brush can fixate its own nitrogen using nodules in its root system. All right, here we have black twinberry, which is a deciduous shrub, and one that I thought was super weird when I stumbled upon it. The flowers are in pairs, yellow and tubular. This shrub can typically be found in moist areas along streams, in bogs, and moist woodlands. In the late summer, this species will produce shiny black berries that are held by red bracts. The leaves of this shrub are in an opposite arrangement. Here we have mountain snowberry, which is another deciduous shrub, but this one is one of the first to leaf out when the weather starts getting warm, so many animals use it as a food source in the spring. A study in Utah found that mountain snowberry accounted for 24% of the diet for elk and 20% of the diet for mule deer. Many bird species also eat the fruits of this low-growing shrub. Next we have subalpine spirea, which is another shrub, but this one has beautiful pink flat inflorescences and it grows in moist areas. 
Its leaves are arranged in an alternate arrangement. They are simple and they are ovular with little teeth. This shrub is so pretty that they're commonly used in gardens, but once they're planted, they can spread quickly through their underground rhizomes, so they can get a bit out of control. All right, here we have thimbleberry, which is our last deciduous shrub from the Grand Tetons. The leaves of this species look very similar to maple leaves and are arranged in an alternating pattern. This spiny shrub is a relative of raspberries and blackberries, and it will form dense thickets of itself. The fruits of thimbleberry are large, red, and edible, resembling a much larger raspberry. One of my favorite plants from the Grand Tetons is spotted coral root. This is a herbaceous perennial saprophytic orchid. What this means is that it doesn't produce any chlorophyll and it doesn't photosynthesize. This species obtains all of its nutrients from symbiotic fungi in their root systems, and they get nutrients from nearby plants or decomposing organic material. Here is another saprophytic orchid. This one is Pacific Coral Root, which can be distinguished from Spotted Coral Root by its lack of spots. Also, this species has no white on its petals. The flowers are typically pink with a little bit of yellow. Tall White Rain Orchid is another herbaceous perennial plant that is typically found in wet places like bogs, marshes, and near streams. I had found this one hiding amongst some ferns along a stream that bordered one of the lakes in the park. The flowers of this orchid are arranged in a white spike-like inflorescence that typically smells like cinnamon or cloves. In Grand Teton, there are many species of paintbrush, which are herbaceous perennial plants with an alternate leaf arrangement. Depending on the species, paintbrushes can be red, orange, yellow, or pink. The flowers of this species are actually green, but it's the bracts that surround the flowers that are colored. Additionally, paintbrushes are a bit parasitic and will obtain a portion of their nutrients by latching onto the roots of nearby plants. Lupines form a beautiful blue inflorescence that sticks out in the landscape. In fact, the lupine will be common in areas that are commonly overgrazed because they're avoided by cattle since they are toxic. Additionally, this species is a member of the pea family, and like our snowbrush from earlier, lupine can fixate its own nitrogen. This allows the plant to set up shop in soils that would otherwise be unfavorable, and while the lupine is there, it improves the soil quality for other plant species to move in. Sticky purple geranium is a herbaceous perennial forb that, like its name suggests, has sticky glandular hairs that cover the leaves and stem. These glandular hairs allow the species to have an interesting feature. It allows the geranium to be protocarnivorous, meaning that it can dissolve proteins like insects that get stuck in the hairs. When the plant dissolves the protein, it can take up the nitrogen from the protein. Spotted saxifrage is a herbaceous perennial plant that forms a mat of itself on the ground. It has gorgeous white flowers with purple and yellow spots on the petals. I found this plant hidden away in a pile of rocks on a slope and I almost walked right past it. Parsnip flower buckwheat is a herbaceous perennial plant that I felt like was everywhere in the Grand Tetons. Many insects are drawn to the distinctive flowers of this species, which remind me of little cream-colored fireworks or pom-poms. Certain parts of the plant are said to be used for medicinal purposes, like treating colds, stomach aches, or tuberculosis. Lanceleaf stonecrop is a succulent perennial plant that produces inflorescences of yellow flowers. It also has leaves that are arranged in an alternating pattern. This species is easily propagated through cuttings and is therefore commonly used in rock gardens and as an indoor plant. Rosy pussy toes are a mat forming herbaceous perennial species. They are typically found on rocky slopes or in meadows and the flowers are very attractive to pollinators such as bees and butterflies. The silly name of this species comes from the idea that the flowers look like a bunch of kitty cat paws reaching up to the sky. I feel like that was a bit of a stretch with that one, but all in all, I still think it's a very pretty flower. Here's an American pica I found during my trip. This was actually one of three that I found in the span of about 30 minutes. Pikas are small mammals that are related to rabbits. They live at high elevations and they live for about three years on average. 
They make their homes in rocky areas along mountain meadows and will take shelter amongst the rocks. These little fuzzballs spend a great deal of time when they're awake foraging for food, and pikas receive most of their water they need from plants that they eat, so they don't need to go looking around for water to drink. Alrighty, thank you all for watching. I hope that you enjoyed learning about the Grand Tetons with me. If you did, be sure to like and subscribe, and I hope to see you all in my next video.